Wow. Uh, yeah. uh, first of all, my name is David Denning. I'm one of the founding members of South Green Community Energy. It's my great pleasure to welcome you tonight to this event. Uh, on Monday, we thought we'd have maybe a little over a half crowd. Thank you for all coming out. South Spring has this habit of, South Springers have this habit of late registration, but <laughs> I'm so happy we do because I'm relieved. And it's, it's just a great pleasure to have you all here. I think we have an incredibly important message to provide, and uh, I, ho I hope you enjoy tonight's uh, event for doing that, those messages. Um, our, uh, I, I'd first like to start by uh, acknowledging that we're on First Nations territories unceded of the Sinkotan and Holcomian speaking Salish, Coast Salish people. And the kind of thing we're trying to do with our organization, we hope is really consistent with the idea of reconciliation for what has happened in the past to the First Nations here. We hope to see a sustainable world in which renewable energy is one of the chief things that keeps us, unites us together with First Nations. So our goal here tonight is to acknowledge that. Um, our group um, started 10 years ago, and it was a group of, uh, this is our, our program for tonight, Accelerating Pathways to Carbon Zero. And it's really important to think about what carbon zero is. You hear a lot in the news, net zero, but really, we're hoping that people will start to think about removing fossil fuel emissions from our lives entirely as soon as we can. And that's our goal is to accelerate that. <laughs> our group uh, started together when a bunch of very concerned Salt Spring citizens came together in the interest of sustainable future for Salt Spring Island. And put another way, a bunch of Renewable energy geeks decided to make some solar on the island and, and because it was the right thing to do. And uh, about 12 of us started off and eventually we came up with, we did a lot of thinking at the beginning, what should we do here to make uh, renewable energy, especially solar, available to Salt Spring Island? And we started with a, a conference in which we brought together about 200 people from the Gulf Islands and it was really, really successful. Uh, we had meetings about um, electric vehicles, for example, and that really started a real surge of electric vehicles happening on the island. It's still happening. People are really getting into electric vehicles. It's really important part of electrification. Our transportation footprint is a big part of our footprints. And then we, then uh, one of our colleagues, one of our members, Chell Lim, took a look at all the roofs and all the spaces on South Spring that could hold solar. And what we discovered was that the school was maybe a good place. The school gym is facing south. It's got a, a certain amount, a great amount of space. And we came up with a scheme. And when you have a scheme, you have to go talk to the right people. And the right people turned out to be students at GISS. We met with the Environment Club at the time. And they said, what you're talking about is a good idea. And so we talked to them more, and they, we, they said, well, we'll help. And so we went to the school board. We went to a school board meeting. And these students also went to that school board meeting and sat down with the school board dire directors. And there was no question it was going to happen because of these students. So my message is, when you need something to happen, get students to help you out. And, and, and they will. So we really started working hard. We collected money. We got all kinds of things happening. And eventually, we, in November of, of uh, 2014, we started putting solar panels on the roof of the school, high school gym. We were able to put uh, 84 pa solar panels on the roof of the gym, 21 kilowatts of power. And it has been functioning since early uh, 2015. And all of the power that goes into the electric grid or into the school, most of, well, all of it really goes into the school because that school has much more 
need for electricity than we could provide with the system. But all of that grid, all of that power is monitored and the school district pays us back, pays a scholarship fund back, and thus was the creation of the Solar Scholarship. And that Solar Scholarship... <laughs> thank you. So students every year graduating from GISS have the opportunity, if they're, especially if they're interested in renewable energy futures and their future being involved with that, they have the opportunity for the scholarship so far We've given out about $16,500 in scholarships to, over those years. So we're very proud of that. The next year we had another conference, and that other conference was hugely successful with over 250 people. And it really also helped to set the tone for understanding what, it need, what needs to happen for us to have a, re, a renewable, renewable energy-based sustainable society here on Salt Spring. Now, we're still working hard on this, but it's, it started the seed for that. And one of the things we did was to start the very first um, BC Community Solar Coalition. And that was started by one of, one of our guys, again, Chell Lim, who uh, was a hero. <laughs> Many of you know Chell, and he, he fights into, indefatigably for getting BC Hydro to come around to a democratic energy future for Salt Spring and for the entire province. So we really owe a lot to these people. Uh, other people in the audience have worked on this as well, trying to get, m move our society, move BC Hydro towards it, an agreement about let's have democracy, ener energy democracy on Salt Spring Island. And let me tell you, fighting BC Hydro is tough, and those guys have done an incredible job. We also came up with the idea to look at school buses as a way to get uh, electricity into our island. And electric school buses just had started and we were right at the edge. We, we made a study of electric school bus and how it would affect the school district. And uh, we would, there would be major savings over time by investing in school bus. We took some of the school board members we took school board members on a tour. We managed to get a bus to come to Salt Spring Island. We gave them a tour. Just, just this, this year, we now have two electric school buses on the island. And there's, uh, and I can hardly see you again. Uh, and as a result of that, um, children, students, children on this island have the much better healthy environment. As soon as we get all those buses in uh, electric, we will eliminate a lot of the health risks that school buses create for our students. But buses idling on the side of the road while students are lining up, it's a terrible health risk for our students. And we've started to do that, and I'm really proud of the school district in actually furthering that. And another thing we've done is partner with different groups, and I've had the opportunity to work with Galliano Conservancy, who are leaders in many of these things. So it's not just our community that's moving ahead. A lot of the Gulf Island communities are, and we have real leadership people in all of those communities. And I was able to work with on a curriculum, but also work with some of the education things. And education is a very important part of our, our mandate. Uh, and you, know, you can look at little micro uh, solar panels, and then you can use them for different kinds of things. So, uh, <laughs> micro uh, solar erasers are a good idea to, to test this, these kind of ideas. Thank you to the Galliano Conservancy and the other partners for that. We also partnered with Viridian Energy, and down at Shaw Gardens in the Burgoyne Valley, which is the community uh, gardens there, we set up solar panels on the roof of their gazebo and set up solar. Uh, so electric charging, so m much of the charging is, is, m m um, is created by the solar. Uh, and you can charge your bicycle there, you can charge your tools, you can charge your electric car. So we're trying to close the cycle uh, of, foss of fossil fuel use in the, in the, in the uh, agriculture area. So, and so we've really accomplished a lot with that. And there's our group sitting in front of the solar panels on top of that gazebo. And another recent project, and this will be the last I'll talk about, is if you go to Croftonbrook uh, affordable housing units, you know there are about 40-some units 
in the two buildings that are there at Croftonbrook, just up above the, uh, of the end of, uh, of uh, Ganges Harbor. And uh, our group really worked hard to help finance that with iWave as our, our partner. And it's an incredible project because it's put on, on the roof of those buildings, it's put 298 panels, 134 kilowatts of, of feed into the grid. And what this does is it provides extra, essentially lowers the cost of electricity for the people living in those buildings by providing electricity for the common load of, of the buildings. So it's another great project. And the, the group of people, I hope I haven't left anybody out, but the, the names on this thing, I'm not gonna go over them one by one, but these are the heroes of Salt Spring Community Energy, and uh, I would just like you to join me in thanking you. <laughs> we still have more to come in this series of events that we're doing, it's a month long program. Uh, we've already had a great electric vehicle and transportation and work fair. Uh, at the at school. We've had a couple of talks at the library. We've got a couple more things happening. And if you really want to know what's happening exciting, tomorrow there'll be the first visit to, to Ganges Harbor of the Harbor Air electric float plane. And you'll have a chance to see that tomorrow between 10 and 2. You want to go down and have a look at that. That's the future of, of, of flight around these islands. And they are pioneering it, and we're just delighted to have them here with us to share that with us. So. And tomorrow afternoon at GISS in the multipurpose room, you can also take in a very important discussion about all the challenges we face in order to electrify things like ferries, transportation, some of the trucking industry, and so forth. Uh, and so we have several guests who are coming and will carry out a panel discussion. It will be moderated by our own Ch Chell Lim. And uh, it includes Sean Braden, who, by the way, is a GISS grad. So <laughs> that's terrific. And Erica Holtz, these are two of the uh, engineers who are working on the project with Harbor Air. We have Babak Manocharina. And he uh, is the specialist for electrification of ferries in BC. So this is really important to understand that we're looking at, we're talking to people who are on the leading edge of what's gonna happen in the way of electrification. Hopefully we can influence them with our questions, with our demands. You know what Salt Spring Islanders are like. And finally, Warren Bo Boyle, who's the low carbon uh, file manager for BC Transit, so again, BC Transit has plans for electrification, but they're focusing on city. Why shouldn't they focus on rural communities like Salt Spring Island? We could be a leader, we could be an example. So it's really, hopefully we can talk them into it. So come out and help talk them in. And by the way, if you show up at two, there's gonna be a cake celebrating our 10th anniversary. And so carrot cake is, you like carrot cake, don't miss that. <laughs> we'll have a bit of tea and so forth. Finally, there's two more, two more lectures in our series. One will be on Solar 101, so if you're, if you're at all thinking about putting solar on your house, and I personally feel, as a person who has solar, my wife and I have solar on our house, I really think it's a really good idea. It will help us lower the, the load on the system when we all have electric cars. So we might as well start now. If we can't afford it, let's get those solar systems in. And then batteries on May 18th and the world of batteries is changing remarkably fast, and we're, there's some very exciting things happen. We may be able to solve some of the very, very difficult problems that this world has right now with climate change and the dangers ahead by having more and more batteries, and there's some very good outlook to that. So that, that will be final, final uh, one in our series. So now, I mentioned that it's a good idea to involve students in your projects. <laughs> And, it, and it's my pleasure tonight. I've gone to Salt Spring uh, GISS and I've talked to the students there and, and there's some very enthusiastic students. It's my pleasure tonight to uh, introduce two students who will then introduce Bob McDonald. Uh, so if Sonia 
Reynolds and Maggie Naft Naft Naftali will come up. Hello everyone, my name is Sonia Reynolds. And my name is Maggie Naftali. And we are both grade 12 students at Gulf Island Secondary School right here on Salt Spring. Um, <laughs> so I think the first thing that we'd like to start with is we'd like to start by expressing our immense gratitude to introduce someone as profoundly impactful as Bob McDonald. Um, and we'd also like to thank the Salt Spring Community Energy Group, specifically David Dennings, for reaching out to us so we could be here tonight. We're very grateful for that. Okay. So many of you likely know Bob McDonald uh, as the host of the CBC show Quirks and Quarks. Um, I, like many, grew up listening to Quirks and Quarks, and, and I was really inspired by the accessible approach to science storytelling. And you know, it really encouraged my curiosity about the natural world and learning. And you know, I think that has in turn led me to pursuing environmental studies and environmentalism. Um, so Bob is also a television host, and he's been a commentator for a number of CBC shows, including The National and The Greatest Canadian Invention. Um, he's also written many influential books. You probably know his most recent one, The Future is Now, Solving the Climate Crisis with Today's Technology. Um, so after his presentation, we're going to have a short little Q&A. And then you can buy his book, or you can maybe even get it signed in the lobby. So that's going to be exciting. Um, and so on top of many of his great works, he's also been the recipient of many outstanding awards, including being appointed an officer of the Order of Canada, which I thought was pretty cool. Um, <laughs> He also has an asteroid named after him, which is called the Bob McDonald. I thought that was pretty cool because not many people have that. Um, but I think the most important thing about Bob is his commitment to climate action. Um, scientists have been warning us about the effects of climate change for years now, and it, I think it can all feel a bit overwhelming. Uh, the most recent Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report highlights the urgency of the climate crisis. And I have a quote for you from the U.S. Special Presidential Envoy for Climate, John Kerry, that today's message from the IPCC is abundantly clear. We are making progress, but not enough. We have the tools to stave off and reduce the risks of the worst impacts of the climate crisis, but we must take advantage of this moment to act now. It is easy, especially for young people, to feel helpless about climate change, but we want to make clear that every bit of warming we can prevent is meaningful. We truly and sincerely believe that we can make the most change through optimism and collective action. And we're looking forward to hearing about Bob's take on incorporating technology into climate solutions and how we'll be able to make those changes. Education is also vital in understanding this climate crisis. In today's day and age, gaining access to rich stores of knowledge is easier than ever. We strongly encourage all of you to become educated about the climate crisis and consider how your unique skills and passions can be utilized to make that change. This could be as simple as learning about our local ecosystems or reading articles of literature related to the environment. Perhaps change for you is recycling more or buying your clothes secondhand. Maybe change is signing a petition or attending a protest. Whatever it may be for you, we strongly encourage you to do it. Once again, we would like to express our deep gratitude to be here tonight, and it is with great respect that we welcome Bob McDonald. I am so happy to be here. This is a, a high school is doing amazing things. I've spent more than half of my career trying to educate and inspire young people, and it is so wonderful to see young people taking action and really doing things about the future. This is how change comes about. It's communities showing how you can go green and not go broke. <laughs> how you can go green and not have to go back to the trees and the caves. How you can set an example. That's how change is going to happen. And it's so wonderful what Salt Spring is doing, and I'm, I'm just so happy that you've invited me to be here tonight. I want to talk about my latest book. Uh, I wrote this book because I was getting depressed. 
I was getting depressed because I've been reporting on the environment for a very long time, ever since my hair was black. <laughs> I notice a lot of you still dye your hair gray like I do. Eh? It's called executive blonde. Or the phrase I like, just because there are ashes in the chimney doesn't mean the fire's out down below. <laughs> I had a couple over for dinner the other night. They dyed their hair gray like this too. And afterwards, the husband said, we went to a really good restaurant the other night. You should check it out. I said, sure, what's it called? And he went, oh. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you know what I'm talking about, right? <laughs> he said, uh, what's the name of that flower that you give to someone when you really like them, the red flower? I said, Rose? Then he turned to his wife and he said, Rose, what's the name of the restaurant we went to? <laughs> Yeah, it's happening to us all, right? No, I was, uh, I was getting depressed because I've been uh, reporting on the environment since I look like this. What? Yeah. Look, you've all got a, an album or a drawer full of pictures somewhere with a picture of yourself at another time in your life. So this is me in 1977 before a lot of you people were born, all you young guys. Anyway, 1977. And not only was I living an alternative lifestyle at that time, but it was also when I was asked to do my first job at the CBC. I was asked to write a one-hour documentary on climate change. 1977, for the radio program Ideas. And it was part of a series called Running Hot and Cold. Because back in the 70s, there was a debate in the scientific community about what was going to happen to the Earth's climate. On one side were the geologists, who look way back in deep time. They look at ice cores, they look at tree rings, they look at ocean sediments. And they were saying, you know, we've had four or five ice ages, and between the ice ages are these warm periods that last about 10,000 years. Well, it's been 12,000 years since the last ice age, so we're overdue. It should be getting colder. But on the other side were the climate scientists who were saying, yeah, that's true, but there's this new game in town called greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, methane, water vapor, and they are going to override that cycle, and we're going to get warmer. So that was in the 1970s. Well, we know who won that debate. The Earth did get warmer especially in the Arctic. The Arctic is something like four degrees warmer than the rest of the planet because we're losing ice. This was predicted. The scientists back in the 70s were saying, yep, we're going to lose ice in the Arctic. And white ice reflects sunlight. Dark seawater absorbs sunlight and turns it into heat. So there's going to be a feedback effect. And they were predicting that would happen in the 50s, 2050s. It's already happening now. They predicted that storms would get stronger. We now have more Category 5 hurricanes happening. And those hurricanes are traveling farther north now, as we saw in Canada last year on the East Coast, when the hurricane hit Newfoundland and Cape Breton. They predicted that we would have droughts. Lakes in the southwestern states, Lake Powell, Lake Mead, are drying up because California has been in a state of drought for more than five years. Yeah, they got a lot of snow this year, so now they're dealing with floods, but there's still not enough to refill these reservoirs. They predicted that. They predicted that we would have more wildfires. This is us two summers ago. This is British Columbia. We're in there somewhere. You can just barely make out the bottom of Vancouver Island right here. It's, there it is. This is the smokes and wildfires that we had going through there. They predicted that, and on and on and on. So all of this stuff was kind of getting me down. And what have we done about it? What have we been doing about it? And it's been frustrating for me to listen for all these years to these scientists warning us about what was going to happen, but we weren't doing anything about it. There just wasn't any action. We have had these climate conferences that the United Nations calls. I was at the very first one, Rio 1992, the Rio Earth Summit. And world leaders came together, presidents, prime ministers, leaders of countries, they got together in Rio de Janeiro, and they said, yes, this is a big issue, 
Climate change, biodiversity. We got to take care of both of them. Then they all went home and nothing happened. And then we have more meetings. We've had 26 of these meetings. And every time they move the goalposts, they keep moving the goalposts. And despite all of this, it's still not enough. It's still not enough. Young people are angry. <laughs> Don't get angry. Do what these folks are doing. Don't get angry. Get active. Don't get angry. Because if you get angry, you get depressed. But we haven't. The bottom line, no matter what governments have said, no matter what, no matter what governments have done, and they have done some things, including here in Canada, but our emissions are still going up. That's the bottom line. World emissions are still going up. So this was kind of getting me down. It was getting me down. So I thought, okay, rather than, oh, <laughs> the other thing I did not expect over all this time was a well-orchestrated and well-executed campaign of climate denial, which we now know was sponsored in part by some of the oil companies. And what did that do? It confused the public. It put out misinformation or just information that was wrong to slow down the process and keep business as usual. And they were successful. They were successful. We're living in an age of misinformation. And that really bothers me a lot. So what are we going to do about it? Well, when I did the research for the book, I thought, OK, enough of pointing to the problems. We've been doing that for more than 40 years. What are the solutions? What are the solutions? And I came to the wonderful realization that all of the solutions to go green already exist. We don't need to invent anything new to go to a low carbon or a zero carbon economy. Those technologies already exist. We know how to capture the energy of the sun. We just saw it. We know how to capture the energy of the wind, the energy that comes out of the ground, the energy that flows on the tides, the energy that it, it literally grows on trees if you want it. So we know how to do this. We know how to do it. We just haven't been employing it. So that's what I did in my book. I gathered all of this stuff together to give you an update. Where are we with solar and wind and geothermal and all of these things? And I just put it all together to give you some background and a context of where we are. Now, the big elephant in the room, though, is oil. And one thing that I really don't want to encourage is that we make the oil companies the bad guys. Because if you label the oil companies as the evil oil empire, and then the good tree huggers over here, you polarize it. And when you polarize it, both sides dig in their heels and nothing happens. And if there is contact, it's conflict, and people are getting hurt, and that's not right. Let's cooperate with them. Now, there's a reason, and we don't have to get off oil, by the way. I'll get back to that in a second. We don't have to get off oil. But the reason that we've been addicted to this stuff for 150 years, the reason it ran the Industrial Revolution, the reason it turned us into a super species, is because it contains a huge amount of energy. There's a unit of energy uh, when you're looking at how much work could a barrel, a standard barrel of oil do. It's called a joule. And one barrel contains six and a half billion joules. So what's a joule? Pick up a bag of rice that weighs one kilo. Hold it out like this and do that. That's one joule. One kilo raised one meter is one joule. Do this six billion times and you've got the amount of energy in one barrel of oil. That's a lot. That's huge. That's a lot. No wonder we like it. It's dense. There's so much energy in oil. The only other form of energy that has more energy than oil per weight for volume is nuclear. Everything else is spread out all over the place. Sure, there's lots of solar energy. In fact, the amount of energy, solar energy hitting the Earth in one hour is more than all of our civilization uses in a year. That's amazing. One hour. But it's spread out. It's not dense like this stuff. Now, here's another way to think about this. How dense is the oil? Let me give you another unit of measurement. The Great Pyramids of Egypt. A physicist did a little calculation. They calculated how many stones are in the pyramids, how much do they weigh, and how high were they raised to give the amount of jewels that were used to build the pyramids. This is purely theoretical. But it turns out that is 2.4 trillion jewels to build the pyramids. 
The slaves who did it probably would tell you they put that much out in sweat. But that's how much it took. What's that mean? Well, let's go back to oil. How many barrels of oil would it take to build the pyramids? It turns out, 400. One oil well, one productive oil well can produce 400 barrels in one day. One day is the production. From one well could build the pyramids. It took the ancient Egyptians 20 years to do it once. That's how much energy is in oil. It's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. So we're not going to let this stuff go. We're not going to let it go. It's too energy dense. It gives us too much. The problem has been not the oil itself. It's been how we've been burning it. Because all we do is dig it out of the ground and we light a match. And it goes boom. Great. I mean, think about coal. It's a rock that burns. <laughs> you take this rock out of the ground, you light a match, and it burns. How nice. You don't have to do anything to it. But the problem is that when you do that, not all of it burns. There's stuff left over. Um, oh, by the way, <laughs> just another context here of how much oil we burn. If you took all the energy that we use on Earth, we burn about 2 million pyramids a year. That's how much we consume. That's how much we consume. And we don't even think about it. You know, you just flip a light switch, the energy is always there. We take it for granted because we're so spoiled. So let me just get on here. We call hydrocarbons hydrocarbons because it's a long chain of carbon atoms with hydrogen atoms stuck to it. I like to think of it like um, a chain of Christmas lights. So when you plug in the lights, it's the bulbs that come on. The, the cord doesn't light up. The cord's just support. When you burn a fossil fuel, whether it's natural gas or coal or oil, it's the hydrogen that's coming off. It's the hydrogen that's giving you the energy. The carbon stays behind. And that's what comes out as either soot out of a diesel engine that causes air pollution, or the carbon wants to combine with something else, like, oh, oxygen, carbon dioxide. Or if there's sulfur around, sulfur dioxide. These are the emissions that are left over, and that's the problem. Those are the, the gases that are changing the climate, not the hydrogen. Hydrogen, by itself, is a great fuel. When you burn hydrogen, hydrogen combines with oxygen, and you get dihydrogen monoxide, H2O. Water, that's it. It's a great fuel. Except hydrogen doesn't come naturally out of the ground. You can't just dig it out. You've got to make it you got to make it. So we can make it from fossil fuels. We can make it from fossil fuels. How about we just take the hydrogen out and leave the carbon in the ground? Well, there's a company in Saskatchewan doing that. They're called Proton Technologies. And what they're using are abandoned oil wells. So these are wells that have already been pumped out, but there's still a lot of oil in the ground. And they take two wells. Down one of them, they inject steam. High pressure steam. And there's a chemical process called reforming where the steam reacts with the oil and removes the hydrogen. And the hydrogen bubbles up the other well. The oil stays in the ground. Just the hydrogen comes out. What a great idea. Now, people criticize hydrogen. They say, yeah, well, it takes energy to make it. You know, it takes energy to make it, so it's not worth it. All right. Somebody tell me about the energy it takes to make a liter of gasoline. What's it take to make a liter of gasoline? Well, let's just think about that. Here in Canada, it can start out in northern Alberta and northern Saskatchewan, where you have to drill for natural gas. That takes energy. That natural gas is then pumped out of the ground and piped to the oil sands project. That natural gas is then burned, releasing carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, to heat up the oil, heat up the sand to get the oil out. Then once they get the oil out, they mix it with chemicals to make bitumen, and it has to be pumped by pipe to a refinery, either in Oregon or, more likely, Houston, Texas, thousands of kilometers away from here. And along the way, these big pumping stations running on natural gas have to keep that moving. Once it gets to the refinery, more heat is added to it to get all of the distillates out of it, to get the different products, to get the crude oil, you get the diesel, you get the gasoline, you get the cleaning products, you get all these things out of it. It takes energy to do that. Then you have to take the gasoline and pump it back up here to Canada and distribute it to all the gas stations. So you can put it in your car. 
How much energy did that take? How many emissions were involved in that? Yeah, it's going to take energy to make hydrogen. <laughs> we're already burning huge amounts of energy to do what we're doing now. And that's the thing, you know. As, as the kids were saying, the cost of doing nothing, of staying the same, is higher than whatever we're going to have to pay for the alternative. So there is going to be a cost, yeah. But compared to what we're doing now, sometimes we forget that. So Proton Technologies is looking at hydrogen. How do we burn the hydrogen? Well, there's a couple of ways. Uh, Toyota already makes a car called the Mira. Uh, there's one driving around Victoria because we have one hydrogen station. <laughs> and it's a fuel cell car. So a, a fuel cell is sort of like a battery. It's just a box. But instead of having all the chemicals in one box, which you can run out of fairly quickly, you just run hydrogen through it. And the hydrogen combines with air, with oxygen. And along the way, electricity is produced. There are electrons left over. So that's it. So it's an electric car with a fuel cell in it. So you can run hydrogen. Great. Another thing, Airbus Industries is going one step beyond what Harbor Air is doing. And by the way, I was down this afternoon and saw that electric plane. Go see it. It's really cool. Just the color of it is great. It's this lime green. It's really neat. But Airbus, they're serious about this. They're going to make an airliner that's running on both hydrogen and electricity. It's a, it's a hybrid engine. It's electric with hydrogen assist. They're going to build a commuter prop plane, sort of like our Dash 8s that fly out of Victoria. Uh, they're also going to build a small a regional jet. And they have what's called a blended wing, a futuristic design that will be hydrogen and electric. Now, the one thing about hydrogen, it's a really clean fuel, but it takes up a lot of space because it's a gas. You can liquefy it, but then it's super, super cold and really hard to handle. So as a gas, even compressed, it takes up a lot of space. Normally, gas in airplanes is put in the wings. Well, the wings of these planes are not large enough to carry all the hydrogen, so there's going to have to be a hydrogen fuel tank in the fuselage where you sit. How would you feel getting on an airplane knowing there's a big tank of hydrogen right behind your head? I know what you're thinking. <laughs> it's really too bad that the Hindenburg blew up. It was quite successful, you know. It made many, many trips across the Atlantic. It went all around the world. But they couldn't, and it was built for helium. But this was just before the Second World War, and there was tension between the United States and Germany, and the United States had all the hydrogen. So, or all the helium, rather. So Germany had to go with hydrogen. Now, the thing is, more than half of the passengers on the Hindenburg survived. They survived the crash. Why? Because the hydrogen fire went up. Hydrogen is lighter than air. Look at the picture. The flames are all above the ship. And as the ship settled to the ground, people just jumped out windows. And they ran out from under the hydrogen fire. And the people who died didn't die from the hydrogen. They died from the collapsing structure and the diesel fuel for the engines that burn for the next day. You see, fossil fuels are heavier than air. That's why the fire department shows up at a car accident. Because if there's a leak of gas, it goes down. It stays on the ground and turns the, the car into a barbecue. Hydrogen, you get a leak, it goes up. So it's actually safer. But thanks to the Hindenburg, <laughs> It's got this bad reputation. So get over that, OK? Get, get over the Hindenburg. Just, just get, I shouldn't have even mentioned it. I shouldn't have, shouldn't have even mentioned it. All right, so that's hydrogen. Um, electricity. Now, we've got Harbor Air. You're going with electric buses, which is really fabulous. And I thought it was very brave for uh, Ford to take their iconic muscle car, a light car with a truck engine that produces, what, 600 and something horsepower? a super gas guzzler, and they took that brand and made it electric. I thought that was very brave of them to do that, although you can still get the muscle car. The difference between these two cars in terms of how much energy they, uh, they put out is amazing. A, a car, and, and you don't even have to think about a muscle car. Suppose you drive a little car with a combustion engine in it, and you say, it gets great mileage. It doesn't. Compared to a truck, yeah, it does. Compared to a muscle car, it does. But it still doesn't. Even a small car only gets about 20% efficiency. 20%. That means of all the energy that's in the gasoline, which is a lot, 
only 20% of it actually gets to the wheels and turns the car and makes it move. 80% is thrown away as waste heat. That's how heat engines work. You have to keep pulling heat away or they won't run. So that's why there's a big radiator on the front of your car. That's why the tailpipe is hot. That's waste heat. So you're throwing away 80% of the energy in the gasoline. I think that's nuts. Now, gas engines have been with us, the, the four-cycle engine that we're using in our vehicles now, it's a principle that's been around for more than 150 years, and it was great because it took over steam power, you know, giant locomotives. It was cleaner, it was more efficient. Well, now it's had its day. <laughs> it's had its day. Let's let it go. Because an electric motor is 80% efficient. Almost all the electricity you put into an electric motor turns into motion. Very little is lost of heat. Here's another way to think about it. You go to fill up your car, your combustion car, at a gas station. Now, what's it costing now to fill up a car? <laughs> what's, what, do you, what do you pay here on Salt Spring for a liter? Uh, about $100. About $90? 100 Okay. <laughs> I never thought I would ever say that. $100 for a tank of gas. When I was a kid, and you gray-haired folks know this, <laughs> gas was 25 cents a gallon. That's real, I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding, I know it sounds like an old tale, an old fart. Oh yeah, the good old days. It's true, it was 25 cents a gallon. Anyway, $100 a liter. How would you, okay, think about it this way. You go to the pump, you take it out of the, the nozzle out of the pump, you put it in your car. And then you stop at $20. That's 20% of 100, right? Is it? <laughs> <laughs> There are three kinds of mathematicians. Those who can count and those who can't. Okay, so you stop at 20. Then you take the nozzle, point it into the sky, and pour $80 worth of gas into the air. You would be arrested for polluting the ground, for wasting gas, but that's exactly what we are doing. We're only using 20 bucks out of that 100. Think about that. Think about that. And the price is going to go up. The cost of electricity is coming down from alternative. Do you know that solar power is now cheaper than coal? Solar power is cheaper than coal. Yeah. So electric cars make a lot of sense. But the big problem is the batteries. And I'm glad to see you're having a session here about batteries next Thursday. That's the big problem with the Harbor Airplane. The thing can only run for 55 kilometers once a day. 55 miles, sorry, nautical miles. Yeah, planes use nautical miles. Still not, not a lot. That's, that's between Vancouver and Victoria once. Uh, so, and because the batteries in it are super heavy and they don't carry enough charge to let the thing go, go all day. So battery technology has to evolve. Well, there's so much happening in batteries right now, my book's probably already out of date. Uh, Toyota's working on solid state batteries that are very thin. They don't have the liquids in them, so they won't catch fire. I've heard of Sodium batteries, aluminum air batteries. I even heard of a battery that's made of iron. <laughs> all it does is rust and you get electricity out of it. <laughs> People are looking at all kinds of different materials and whoever does find a material that can hold a huge amount of electricity, the equivalent of a tank of gas that's the same size and weight and you can charge it in the same time it takes to fill up a tank of gas, that person is gonna get rich. Maybe it'll be one of you, who knows? Maybe it'll be one of you. Yeah, that's what we need. The batteries right now, there's so much effort going into that. So watch out, the, the batteries are changing very, very quickly. Um, we have solar, as you saw here. There's an interesting effect, and that's what's happening here in this community, is that the more solar panels that appear on buildings, neighbors ask, they say, hey, how much did that cost you? How much are you saving? And when they find out, they go, hey man, I want some of that. And then you get solar panels on all the houses in the neighborhood. That's how change comes about. Or one community does it, like Salt Spring does it. Have a contest. Let's have a national contest in Canada for the greenest community in Canada. Wouldn't that be great? You guys are ahead. You're way ahead. You, you could win the championship. What would you win? A solar panel. Yeah, I don't know. A magnifying glass. <laughs> you can burn some ants or something. I don't know. Um, yeah. So 
this is, this is uh, one way. We, we also see these gigantic solar farms. One of the criticisms about solar farms is that they're taking up land that can be used for agriculture. And that's true. There is a uh, system called uh, agrivoltaics. So what you do is you make spaces between the solar panels and you grow crops in, in lines between them. But India is investing very, very heavily in solar power right now. They get a lot of sunlight. And as I say, it's cheaper than coal. But they have found another place to put the panels. Instead of one big, gigantic square farm like this, they put them over canals. India is riddled with canals. The whole country's been irrigated. And they've done some experiments putting them over canals. So now your area that you're looking for is very long instead of wide. And they found that there was a double benefit to doing this. One, the solar panel shaded the water, which cut down on evaporation and also cut down on the growth of algae in the water. Two, solar panels actually work better when they're cool. So the water was cooling them from below. Win-win situation. California is looking at doing the same thing because they have a lot of canals down there as well. So there are other places to put solar panels. But here's the one that really got me when I was uh, doing some research. There's another kind of solar panel a transparent solar panel, which doesn't seem to make sense. <laughs> How can something that lets light go through it turn light into electricity? These materials, called perovskites, are a form of crystal that can be tuned to other wavelengths of light that we don't see, like ultraviolet. Insects can see ultraviolet, we don't. So they'll take that and turn that into electricity, or infrared and turn it into electricity. Now, the thing is, if you make windows out of this, think about how many windows we have in our cities. That is a huge, huge area. And they would be incorporated into the architecture of the building. You wouldn't even know they were there. They're talking about perovskite paint. <laughs> I love this. Perovskite paint. So just paint your house, and it's solar. They're also talking about on the inside, if you had perovskite paint on the inside of a room, the light that we're shining here from these lights, some of that would be absorbed by the walls and turned back into electricity. Recycling light. What a neat idea, I love it. They're talking about having solar fabrics. Solar fabrics, charge your phone by putting it in your pocket. What a great idea. Solar, solar is gonna be everywhere and you won't even know it. It's going to be incorporated. So that's the future of solar, which I find, I find really interesting. OK, wind. We've been capturing wind energy for centuries. The Egyptians sailed up and down the Nile. We crossed oceans on wind power. Holland built the whole country on wind power. Here in North America, when people left the cities and moved out to the west, the ubiquitous farm windmill was pumping water. And at night, they had these little generators that made ele enough electricity to keep the lights on. They were everywhere. Well, windmills have changed dramatically. For one thing, they've gotten a lot bigger, and they have settled onto this one design of the three-bladed propeller style. And I say propellers because they took a tip from the aviation industry, and the blades are now actually wings. They fly. They fly through the air, and they develop lift. So they fly. They're very, very efficient. And only three blades means minimum material. And they're getting bigger. They're getting a lot bigger. Because in wind, as in solar, size matters. And it has to do with that old formula that you had to learn when you were in school, pi r squared. Right? <laughs> there was a, a, a primary school that was having a parents' night. And they said, we've got our smartest kid in kindergarten. And she's going to come up and tell us what she knows. And little Janie comes up and she goes, pi r squared. Everybody goes, whoa, wow, really smart kid. Then the teacher comes out and says, no, no, that's wrong. Pi are round, cake are square. <laughs> Get used to it. <laughs> yeah, well, the R, that R squared thing, that's the blade of a turbine. It's the radius from the middle out to the edge. If you make it a little bit longer, you, you get the square of that as your area. Your area goes up by the square. So you make it twice as long, you get four times the area. Make it three times longer, you get nine times the area, the sweep area. 
So that's why windmills are getting bigger. And they are getting very, very big. At the time I wrote the book, which was just last year, uh, the largest was the Halyad X 12 megawatts. That one turbine could power 16,000 homes. I have since heard that there's a bigger one at 15 megawatts. This is how big these things are. Down in the corner there, that's our parliament buildings to scale. To scale. Two and a half times the height of the Peace Tower in Ottawa. They're enormous. And I was thinking about that as I was coming here today. I came here on my, my sailboat. And as I was going by the big mountain that you have here, one of these up on that peak could power all of Salt Spring and Pender. 16,000 homes, probably even Galliano. One turbine up on that hill. Now that would be perceived in two ways. <laughs> Either people would say, wow, look at Salt Spring. They've gone futuristic with green energy. Isn't that great? And other people are going to look at it and say, that's the ugliest thing I've ever seen in my life. It's like the fellow that goes to his doctor. The doctor says, I have some bad news. He says, what is it? He said, you've only got a week to live. He said, that's terrible. Can I have a second opinion? The doctor says, okay. I think you're ugly. <laughs> so that's going to have to be one of the issues we got to deal with. People don't like looking at wind turbines. <laughs> anyway, these are the discussions we have to have. These are the discussions we have to have. It's, it's not just the technology itself, but what's the social impact, uh, what's the cultural impact. We have to have these discussions before we move forward. Okay, going beyond wind. These giants, by the way, won't be sitting on top of your mountain. Don't worry about it. The blades are all made in one piece. They're too big to get up mountain roads. So they'll be offshore. Europe is doing this. The U.S. is going to do it in the Atlantic. Canada doesn't have any plans for offshore wind at the moment that I know of. We could. The ocean gives you more reliable winds. They're stronger. And you can have these platforms. And you don't even have to look at them because they'll be over the horizon. So that's, that's the future of wind. Take the same technology and put it underwater, you got tidal energy. And there's a lot here. And the University of Victoria right now is looking at tidal energy here in the Gulf Islands. Because when the tide goes between the islands, it speeds up. <laughs> I've had this experience when I first moved here. By the way, I live in Victoria. Some of you think I live in Toronto. <laughs> yeah, I did for most of my life. But 12 years ago, I moved here. So I've been living here for a while. But when I first moved here, um, I was out on my sailboat. And I had all the sails up, and I'm under control. Oh, beautiful day. Going then I look at the, at the shoreline, and it's going like this. <laughs> I was, the tide was stronger than the wind. I was going backwards. And I, well, I guess we're going this way today. So the tides are very strong. The problem is, if you put turbines underwater like this, and there was some experiments, they found that they got really grungy from all the slime and the mussels and the barnacles, all the gunge I got to scrape off the bottom of my boat every year. So, and if you have to fix them, you got to bring them up. That's very expensive. So the new approach to tidal energy is to make essentially a boat with gigantic wings. It looks like something Batman would drive. Big wings with propellers on the end. You dip them down into the water. They generate electricity. When the tide changes, the boat just swings on the anchor and faces the other way. And if you need to work on them, you just lift them up. And you can work on them on the surface. Scotland is doing this because they have a lot of tidal energy up in the, the Orkneys in the north. And they're shipping these things all around the world. You just put it wherever there's a good tidal current. So tidal energy. And tides are pretty reliable. They're pretty reliable. We know within the minute when <laughs> the tides are going to happen for the next 500 years. So we do that. And you're also going to see in my book uh, some stories, some of my sailing stories, where I've experienced extreme wind and extreme tides. I took my sailboat through the reversing falls of New Brunswick, St. John, New Brunswick, which is the craziest thing I've ever done. It's the, the most powerful tidal current anywhere. It runs above. I went through there on my sailboat, so you'll hear about that. Anyway, energy storage. Energy storage. The big criticism of alternative energy is, look, the sun doesn't always shine. The wind doesn't always blow. The tide goes slack twice a day. What are you going to do when you don't have anything coming in? Well, you've got to store energy. Now, you can do it in batteries, and Tesla will build you a battery pack at considerable cost. That can keep a, a city running for a couple of hours, but that's an expensive way to do it. There are other ways to store energy. We could store it in hydrogen. 
We could store it in hydrogen. Hydrogen sits around in tanks. There's one idea. Another idea. Here's a company in Ontario that is storing energy in air. In air. So what they do, they've got this plant built over top of an abandoned salt mine. And the salt mine has all these big underground chambers that are empty. So they pump air down there. When there's lots of electricity, like overnight, they just keep pumping air, pumping air, pumping air, until it builds up to pressure. And then when you need energy, they let that air out through a tiny hole, and it shoots out really fast, like letting a balloon go, you know, and it spins a turbine. Air, storing energy in compressed air. There's another way to do it. You may have heard of the myth of Sisyphus. Poor Sisyphus. I don't know what he did. I, he insulted the gods. Uh, I, I don't know if he slept with one of their wives or something. I don't know. But he, he insulted the gods. And his punishment was to roll a giant stone up a hill. It would take him all day to do it at tremendous energy. And then once he got to the top, the ball would roll all the way back down. And he would have to start again the next day for the rest of his life. What Sisyphus probably did not realize is that he was the world's first mechanical battery. <laughs> mechanical battery. Think about it. As he's pushing that stone up, he's adding energy to it. He's giving it potential energy, the potential to fall back. And the higher he goes, the more energy it has. And when it's at the top of the hill, if it doesn't roll back, it's storing that energy as long as it stays up there. A mechanical battery. Well, there's a group in Europe taking Sisyphus' idea one step further. Gravitricity, they call it. They've got these giant blocks of concrete that are made of industrial waste products when buildings are demolished. And they have five cranes that lift these blocks up when energy is plentiful into a big stack. And when you need that energy back, a crane lifts the block and lets it fall slowly. And as the block is going down, the motor at the top of the crane that lifted it turns into a generator and it spins making electricity. And with five of these, there's always one going down so you have constant power. Cool, huh? No emissions. Storing energy in gravity. There's another group doing the same thing, but they're dropping blocks down empty mine shafts, which go down thousands of feet. Another group wants to drop them in, up and down on the bottom of the ocean. Lots of ways, but you're storing energy in gravity. And here's a group in Norway they're storing heat. They're storing heat in sand. Sand. I'm sure you've had the experience where you go on a tropical vacation and it's a bright sunny day and you go out on the beach and you forget to put on your flip-flops. You're out on your bare feet. <laughs> sand can be heated up to almost 1,000 degrees and it doesn't melt. So here's the same container in uh, infrared light. It's a, it's a big barrel of sand. And they run pipes through it. And they heat the sand up, and it'll stay hot. And then when you need it, you get the heat out. They're also doing it underground in huge pits, much larger than this. They heat the sand up, and they're getting seasonal heat. Seasonal heat. These hot piles of sand are keeping their homes warm over the winter. Because Norway gets dark winters like we do. Seasonal heat in sand. So there are so many ideas out there, and that's the future of our energy. It's going to come from many, many different sources, including your own home. And we're going to be thinking about it differently. Where did it come from? How am I going to use it? And I, I, there's, there's efficiency that's involved here as well. We're also going to have to rethink nuclear power. Now, I know I'm probably going to get in trouble for this, but Canada has a perfect safety record when it comes to nuclear power. But we're going to do it in a different way in the future. Instead of building these giant billion-dollar, multi-billion-dollar plants that cost billions of dollars to run, they're going to be small, small modular reactors. Now, we've had small reactors around for a long time. They've been powering submarines, aircraft carriers, Russian icebreakers. <laughs> a colleague of mine uh, at the CBC got a trip on one of our icebreakers. I think it was the William Lyon Mackenzie. And he went up to the North Pole. And they had to crunch through ice, and they're crashing and banging through the ice. And when they got to the North Pole, there was a Russian nuclear-powered icebreaker there waiting for them. There's a lot of sovereignty issues up there. Well, the Russian icebreakers are huge, huge. 
and the Russian captain invited the Canadians over for some uh, from, for dinner. Now this is long before the war in Ukraine. He invited them over for dinner, and during dinner, the Russian captain asked his Canadian counterpart. He says, uh, "How many tons of diesel you burned to get here?" And the Canadian captain calculated how many tons of fuel he burned to get up there. And the Russian went, oh, I think we burn a few grams of uranium. And he was right. He was right. That's how much energy is in uranium. It's an unbelievable amount of energy. So the idea behind these things, they're a new design. They're not like the old ones. They're completely sealed up. They can't even melt down because the fuel is already a liquid. They can even burn used fuel. The spent fuel that we have now in our, our nuclear reactors, these things can burn them. They're made in a factory, all the same, and they're shipped to areas such as our northern communities, and they're put underground. You don't touch them. They're underground. Nobody can get at them. And all it is is a, a heat source. You pump water down. It gets hot, turns to steam, comes up, runs a turbine. You keep circulating the water around. That's it. And these are much, much smaller. And if you need more power, just add another one. So we got to have a discussion about this because there's a lot of fear about nuclear, there's a lot of misinformation about nuclear, but it's low carbon and it's 24-7. It's there all the time. It gives you a base load, which we need when all the, the variables are around. So we got to have a discussion about nuclear. The other one that's coming, the opposite of what we're doing nuclear fission is nuclear fusion. And there's a plant being built in France right now that's about to come online. And there's another one that, uh, in the States that they're building, fusion. So fusion <laughs> is the opposite of fission. What we're doing now, we take great big molecules like uranium, and we split them apart, and they give off energy. In fusion, you take small molecules like hydrogen, and you fuse them together. This is what the sun's doing. You fuse them together, and they give you energy. The problem is they don't want to do that. They don't want to do that. Um, like, for example, <coughs> If I try to put my hand through this stand, it doesn't go. Even though my hand, the, the atoms in my hand are 99% nothing, they're empty space. And the atoms in that thing are 99% empty space. But the forces that are holding my atoms together are working against the forces that hold that together. So if you want to fuse things together, you've got to hit them really, really hard, which means you've got to make them really hot. And in fusion, it's ridiculous. They have to heat up this gas. Okay, you ready? <laughs> Makes me laugh. 150 million degrees. That's 10 times hotter than the middle of the sun. 150 million degrees. What are you going to put that in? What kind of container can hold something that's 150 million degrees? So the, the, the only way they can do it is to use incredibly powerful magnets to hold this plasma in the middle of a donut so that it doesn't touch the walls. Suspended in the middle. And the problem has been up until now, the power to run those magnets is more than the power you're getting out. But they're getting close. They're getting close to that break-even point. When fusion sustains itself and we have a little piece of the sun on Earth. Watch out. There's also a joke in the fusion industry. Fusion industry has been 10 years away for 50 years. <laughs> but they say it's getting close, so let's find out. Anyway, so there's another hope. Keep your eye on that. Um, my last thing I want to talk about, just uh, efficiency, efficiency. We waste a lot of energy. We build houses with these that are, that are all the same shape with black roofs on them that absorb sunlight. Uh, another way to cut down on our consumption is called passive solar. Are there any passive solar houses here in Salt Spring? Probably a couple, yeah. It's, it's a really neat idea. You use the same materials that's built, built a regular house. You just change the shape. Put all the windows on the south side and use creative vents at the top and the bottom to make natural cycles of uh, convection within the house, to both heat it during the winter and cool it during the summer. It does work. I've been in these houses. They're amazing. So these are some of the things we can do. I have one final chapter called Great Idea, but... And these are innovative ideas that people have tried that didn't quite work. One of them is space-based solar power, which may still happen one day. The idea is you put up a gigantic satellite in space with mirrors that capture sunlight and then turn it into either a laser beam or a microwave beam and you beam it to the ground and then on the ground there's a receiver station that turns it into electricity. 
Talk about a no-fly zone. You get this big laser beam coming down from space. But it's an idea. So there are lots of ideas. But that's what we need. That's what we need. We need innovation. We need innovative thinking, like we're seeing with the young people in this room tonight. And I'm so happy to hear that. And so happy to see that, that Salt Spring is taking this seriously and moving ahead. We've had so many years. How do we do it? Besides what you're doing, the community thing, is it going to come from the top down? Probably not. However, we did have a lesson. We did have a demonstration on how an invisible threat to humanity passed through the air and was killing thousands of people. And we did something about it. We did something about it when COVID happened. You think about this. COVID came along. People were seeing their, their grandparents dying. We, we could see it all around the world, this disease. We couldn't see the virus itself, but it was in the air and it was killing us. And four elements came together to beat it. First was, oh, at first we, we were told, don't go anywhere. Don't go anywhere. Sit down. This is dangerous. Stay home and lock down. And when we did that, emissions immediately went down. Immediately went down when we stopped driving our cars. And skies around the world in cities that have been polluted for decades turned blue. Skies turned blue. This happened all over the world. That's good news. <laughs> That's good news. When you stop pushing the atmosphere, it starts to clean itself up. It starts to clean itself up, at least the particulate matter. CO2 will be around for a while, but the atmosphere starts healing itself when we just stop pushing it. That was the good news. The four elements. Science identified the virus. The Chinese, to their credit, as soon as they found it, they sequenced its genome, its DNA, and they sent that out to the world. And there was a huge international effort, including right here in Canada, to identify this virus, find out how it works. How do those spikes get into your lungs? How do they, they create a mucus so that you can't breathe, you can't take in oxygen? How does it do that? Number two, industry came along and said, yep, we can, build, we can make uh, vaccines. Number three, government stepped in and said, we're going to support the science, and we're going to support the industry, and we're going to tell the public to change our behavior, which we all did. Now, there was <laughs> the fourth element, the public. Most of us bought into it. Not all of us. <laughs> there was a small, very vocal group who were protesting not the vaccine, but freedom. But they were putting out misinformation about vaccines. But they were a very tiny group. Most of us bought into it. Look at here we are. Here we are. We're back in groups again. What were we told? We were told to flatten the curve. Remember that? We were told to flatten the curve. And we did. It's not over. It's still with us. But we did it. So those four elements came together. The science, industry, government, and the public. We did it in two years. An invisible threat to humanity floating through the air. Well, here's another curve that we need to flatten from another invisible threat to humanity that's going through the air. In fact, it's not so invisible. Can we do that in two years? Can we bring those four elements together? The science has been telling us for 40 years that the problem is there. The industry is ready with green technology. And by the way, they're making money at it. People who invest in green, uh, put solar panels or whatever, are saving money. And people who supply that, that stuff are making money. It's one of the fastest growing sectors of the economy. So business is online. Governments, mm, sort of there, but not enough. And the public, we're hesitant. We're hesitant because we've been told misinformation and we're confused. So let's do some research and let's move ahead. Let's get on with it because <laughs> we live in the Garden of Eden. We live in the Garden of Eden. I've been a space enthusiast my whole life and I've explored along with NASA all the planets and we've now found more than 5,000 planets going around other stars. It looks like every star in our galaxy has planets going around it. But none of them are like this. We have yet to find another Earth. We will. We will. But so far, all the planets we have found will kill you. And I met the guy who took this picture. This picture was taken in 1968, the very first mission to the moon, Apollo 8. They didn't land. They did what our Canadian Jeremy Hansen is going to do next year. They went to the moon, they went around, and they came home. That was it. And the guy who took this picture, his name was Bill Anders. I had breakfast with him. And I asked him, I said, what was it like to take the famous Earthrise picture? 
And you know what he said? He said, we weren't intending to take that. That was not in our itinerary. He said, our job was to photograph the moon. We were to look at the landing sites and take pictures of those, not the Earth. And he said, it wasn't until we went around the moon three times, and on the third orbit, the capsule just happened to be facing forward, and the Earth came up over the horizon. And he said, all three of them just stuck their noses to the window and went, holy sh cow, look at that. Look at that. And then the commander, James Lovell, said, did you get the picture? Oh, oh yeah, click. Did you get the picture? And what he said, and I've had the fortune to meet several people who've been to the moon, they all said the same thing. The contrast between what's at the bottom of the picture in the foreground and what the Earth is. The bottom, the sky is black because there's no air. It'll kill you. The moon will kill you. Buzz Aldrin, who was on the first mission with Neil Armstrong, he said, the moon's a very interesting place, but it's not a very nice place. And he's right. You go for a walk on the moon without a spacesuit, you'll be dead in about 15 seconds. Would you like to see my imitation of somebody on the moon without a spacesuit? <laughs> okay. Suppose we're in a room like this, but we're on the moon. You don't need to wear your spacesuits because the room is providing all the air and everything we need. And I decide I want to go for a lunar walk. And all I do is I go to the door and I just open it and I step out. Here's what happens. I open the door. That's one small step. <laughs> I'm looking for a breath. I'm looking for a breath that will not come. All the air rushes out of my lungs, but I can't breathe in because there's no air out there. It's a vacuum. And because there's no pressure around my body, the fluids in my body start to boil. And they burst out of my eyeballs and my ears and my nose and my mouth and any other orifice. And it forms pink snow in front of my face. It freezes and slowly falls to the ground in the low lunar gravity. I slowly fall to the ground with it, gasping for a breath that will never come. And as I lie there, I'm getting cooked by solar and cosmic radiation. That's a walk on the moon. <laughs> yeah, 15 seconds, you did. <laughs> and even if you go, you know, woo, woo, that was a mistake, you'll probably be the ugliest person anywhere because you're, uh, yeah, it'd be awful. So. All the planets will kill you. Mercury's too hot. Venus is poisonous atmosphere. Mars doesn't have any oxygen. All the planets we know of will kill you. It's not like Star Trek. I love Star Trek. I love science fiction. It's great. We need it. But it bugs me every time they go to a planet. It's always a really nice day. <laughs> nice and warm. They don't even wear coats, for God's sake. It's not like that. So. This is it. This is it. This is it. And yes, we will find another Earth someday, but it's going to be really, really far away, and we can't even get to it. So this is it. And people will go to Mars, but they'll have a hard time living there. Let's take care of this one. We have the ability to do it. The technology already exists. Let's stop focusing so much on the problem. We don't ignore it, but not, let's not focus so much on how bad it is. Let's think about how good it could be. Let's move ahead. And I will be in the lobby, and I would be happy to sign this book for you. Thank you so much for having me here tonight. Thank you. And I wish you well.